Barry Gord, I want you to know, in my heart and mind, you are a genius and a king. Without you, Barry Gordy, I don't think music would be the same today. <laughs> a visionary, a talent developer, self-believer, a true leader, you name it. We could go on and on, but Berry Gordy Jr., the charismatic Berry Gordy Jr., was everything you could think of. To many, he was a God-sent man brought to save the people, the black people. In an era where it was common practice for white artists like Peggy Lee and Pat Boone to take songs from the black artists and make cover songs, Berry Gordy's mission was to challenge the status quo by putting the black artists on the map, a move which looked and seemed impossible. But as someone who was always a risk-taker and calculative in his moves, he managed to break barriers and did the unthinkable, creating something that turned out to be legendary, the birth of Motown Records, a label that gave a platform to the less fortunate, those who had nothing but big dreams and God-given gifts. He made it possible for the world to see the other side of the black people the world had never seen since the days of slavery. He gave hope to every upcoming poor kid that they too could be stars and appear on TV one day. All they had to do was put in the work and keep it burning inside them. From legendary vocal groups such as The Temptations, The Supremes, The Four Tops, Martha Reeves and The Vandellas, to greats such as Marvin Gaye, Tammy Terrell, Michael Jackson, Mary Wells, Lionel Richie, you name them, the list is endless. He created legends after legends. The reason why the Motown Record Company is considered the most successful in the history of mankind is not only due to the quality of music it produced, but also the impact it had on racial segregation. Berry Gordy made it possible for both whites and blacks to enjoy good music, worked with both races which saw the end of the division that had been earlier. Those who experienced the full wrath of the harsh and cruel Jim Crow laws will agree he played a huge deal in this. And as they say, where money is involved there must be conflicts. He isn't and wasn't immune to this. While many regard him so highly, there's a section who actually view him as a villain. They see him as nothing but a selfish and greedy capitalist and businessman who allegedly played the artists under his label, underpaying them and taking advantage of their innocence in the industry. People also allege he always wanted things to go his way and always prioritized profits over the well-being of the artists. Do you think this holds some meat? Or these are just people out to destroy his name? Before we go in depth into dissecting the controversies and unveiling the uncomfortable truths, let's first get to know how this school dropout and former boxer went on to found one of the most successful record labels of all time. Born on November 28, 1928 in Detroit, Michigan, Berry Gordy III, also known as Berry Gordy Jr., was the seventh of the eight children of Berry Gordy II and Bertha Fuller, a middle-class couple. Their parents, both natives of Washington County in Georgia, had in 1922 migrated to Detroit in fear of the racist atmosphere of the American South. Berry Gordy Sr., or Pops as they called him, was a son of a slave owner, James Thomas Gordy, and one of his female slaves, Esther Johnson. In 1918, Pops met a young Bertha Fuller, who was a teacher at the time and the two married shortly after, before moving north four years later. While in Detroit, with the excellent business skills of Berry Gordy Sr., acquired from his father, and the tremendous organizational and operational skill set from the young teacher Bertha Fuller, it was no doubt they were set for success when they decided to venture into a number of businesses to help sustain the big family. Booker T. Washington Grocery Store, Gordy Printing Company, Gordy Construction Company were the main family businesses. Bertha even co-founded the Friendship Mutual Life Insurance Company. And just as gifted as they were, they decided to make it their mission to pass it on to their children. Strictness, discipline and most importantly, togetherness were some of the values they instilled in their children right from the word go. 
On top of this, they were heavy on entrepreneurship and would often use their kids to give a hand in the businesses once they came of age, a move that would prove to be revolutionary later on. Over to a young Berry Gordy Jr., he was quite unique from the rest. Unlike his siblings who enjoyed working in the various businesses, he was less inclined to following that path. To add on this, he seemed to be the only one struggling in school as he was not interested in class. His interest was elsewhere, and that was music. His dream was to write songs. When he joined Northeastern High School, he joined music class. However, in 1945, while in 11th grade, something happened that changed the trajectory of his life. He was kicked out of music class. In an act of retaliation, he decided to drop out of school, never to be seen again. For those who thought his strict father would slaughter him afterwards, you are wrong. Berry was in some way his father's favorite. You see, even though he was the second last born in the family and had two elder brothers, he was the one that was named after his father. It was like his father wanted him to be the one to continue carrying his legacy. And with this came the special privileges, special privileges like being allowed to be himself and follow his heart. It is to no surprise that when he decided to venture into professional boxing after dropping out of school, his father was supportive. Boxing had been a great deal for him ever since the age of eight, when the legendary Joe Louis became the world champion, sending the African-American in jubilations across the country. A young Berry Gordy saw how genuinely happy his family was that day and made it his mission in life to find a way to have them be that happy again. It is to no surprise that when he joined boxing, his main aim was to be like his mentor. In his boxing career, he had his achievements. One of the 15 matches he fought, he won 12 of them. Two, in 1948, he appeared on the same card as his idol, Joe Lewis, something he cherishes to date. His boxing career was, however, cut short in 1950 when he was drafted by the United States Army in 1951 for service in the Korean War. Arriving in Korea in May 1952, Gordy was first assigned to the 58th Field Artillery Battalion, 3rd Infantry Division near Panmunjom. He later became a chaplain's assistant, driving a jeep and playing the organ at religious services at the front. His tour in the Korean War was completed in April 1953. By the time he returned to the U.S. in 1953, Berry had given up on the idea of a boxing career totally and was instead interested in pursuing a career in music. All along, his love for music never faded. He began writing songs and decided to open a record store by the name 3D Record Mart, which he exclusively dedicated to jazz music. The business lasted just two years before it folded. Gordy had gotten married in 1953 to 19-year-old Thelma Louise Coleman, and the two had two kids at the time. With a family to support, and just like any other responsible man, he decided to take a job on a Lincoln Mercury plant assembly line in 1955. The monotony of putting upholstery in cars all day had one benefit. He could compose songs in his head while working. Dissatisfied with the tedious nine-to-five life, he decided to resign shortly after, much to the dissatisfaction of his wife, leading to the separation of the two. With him now being as poor as a church mouse, he decided to go ask his sister Gwen to host him while he tried to get on his feet. Thanks to his family's influence and connection, he got to know Al Green, a manager of a talent club known as the Flame Show Bar, owned by Morris Wasserman. Al Green would introduce Gordy to singer Jackie Wilson. Mr. Wilson went on to record Reet Petite, a song that Berry Gordy co-wrote with his sister Gwen and her then-boyfriend writer-producer Billy Davis. The track was a hit overseas and a moderate success in the US. That was all Berry needed to stir up a little heat and attention in the music business. Wilson recorded six more songs co-written by Gordy over the next two years, including Lonely Teardrops, which topped the R&B charts and got to number seven in the pop chart. The Gordy siblings and Davis also wrote All I Could Do Was Cry for Etta James at Chess Records. As Berry racked up a few modest hits, he had a very important revelation, 
The royalty checks he got compared to what Decca Records made from the modest hits was astonishing. He realized that writing the hits wasn't enough. He needed to own them. His entrepreneurship spirit was not giving him peace. The final confirmation came after he received only $3.19 as producer's royalty check, which his friend Smokey Robinson, who he had been guiding all through in writing, told him to start thinking bigger and stop limiting himself. He now knew it was time to start his own label. Problem was, he needed funds. Luckily, his family came to the rescue yet again. You see, his parents, following the success of the family businesses, had formed a family savings fund, which they called the Burberry Co-op, and had Esther Gordy, the second born, with her no-nonsense character as the one in charge. Berry decided to borrow $1,000 from the family savings fund to finance his dream. A tough Esther was very skeptical and finally settled on giving him $800 and not the original $1,000 he had requested. I asked for $1,000, they only gave me $800. And so I could uh, start trying to go into business for myself. You know, I found that's how strict she was and that's why she was put in charge. In 1959, Berry launched Tamla Records, an R&B label. The company began operating on January 12, 1959. Come to Me by Marv Johnson was issued as Tamla 101. It was a success. Fast forward, the Tamla and Motown labels were then merged into a new company, Motown Record Corporation, incorporated on April 14, 1960. In 1960, Gordy signed an unknown singer, Mary Wells, who became the fledgling label's second star, with Smokey Robinson penning her hits, You Beat Me to the Punch, Two Lovers and My Guy. After I started to write and produce records for you, my career just took off, and uh, you're such a great singer, I really think it was due to you, you know? The Miracles hit Shop Around peaked at number one on the national R&B charts in late 1960, and at number two on the Billboard magazine pop charts on January 16, 1961, which established Motown as an independent company worthy of notice. Later in 1961, the Marvelettes' Please Mr. Postman made it to the top of both charts. Gordy's gift for identifying and bringing together musical talent, along with the careful management of his artist's public image, made Motown a major national and then international success. Over the next decade, he signed such artists as The Supremes, Marvin Gaye, The Temptations, Jimmy Ruffin, The Contours, The Four Tops, Gladys Knight and The Pips, The Commodores, The Velvelettes, Martha and The Vandellas, Stevie Wonder and The Jackson Five. Though he also signed some white acts to the label, Rare Earth, Rustics, via the Rare Earth label, he mainly promoted African-American artists, but carefully controlled their public image, dress, manners and choreography for across-the-board appeal. With a tenacity that reflected his training as a boxer, a drive to succeed that matched the lessons he learned from his parents, and an attention to detail that is evident in the quality and uniqueness of every element of the Motown experience, Berry had built himself an empire. He even established branch offices in both New York City and Los Angeles during the mid-1960s. Having conquered the music industry, he then decided to push his limits by venturing into the motion picture industry. And with this, it forced the company to move its operations to Los Angeles in 1972. He produced the commercially successful biographical drama film on Billie Holiday, Lady Sings the Blues, starring Diana Ross, who was nominated for an Academy Award, Richard Pryor and Billy D. Williams, cast in a role originally for Levi Stubbs of The Four Tops. Although Motown continued to produce major hits in throughout the 1970s and 1980s, it was no longer the major force it had been. Gordy decided to sell his interests in Motown Records to MCA and Boston Ventures on June 28, 1988, for $61 million. In 1989, Gordy sold the Motown Productions TV film operations to Motown executive Suzanne DePasse, who renamed the company DePass Entertainment and runs it to this day. Having single-handedly shaped the soul and pop music industry, Gordy's awards cabinet keeps getting filled. 
He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1988. He was inducted into the Junior Achievement U.S. Business Hall of Fame in 1998 and the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame in 2009. When Gordy received the Songwriters Hall of Fame's Pioneer Award on June 13, 2013, he was the first living individual to receive the honor. In 2016, Gordy received the National Medal of Arts from President Obama for helping to create a trailblazing new sound in American music. As a record producer and songwriter, he helped build Motown, launching the music careers of countless legendary artists. His unique sound helped shape our nation's story. Berry Gordy Square in Los Angeles was designated by the City Council at intersection of Sunset Boulevard and Argyle, where the office of Motown was located. In 2021, he was awarded the Kennedy Center Honors alongside Bette Midler, Joni Mitchell, Justino Diaz, and Lorne Michaels. In 2022, he was inducted into the Black Music and Entertainment Walk of Fame and also awarded with an honorary doctorate from the University of Michigan. Despite him achieving all these, he has had his flaws too. He was in many instances accused of favorism and also exploiting his artists. David Ruffin and Eddie Kendricks of The Temptations accused him of underpaying them. His power-writing trio, Holland Dozier Holland, left the label in 1967 over royalty payment disputes. His tight control pushed away the likes of Gladys Knight, Florence Ballard of the Supremes, just to name a few. Many also say all he cared for was the profit margins and nothing else. He never cared for the welfare of his artists, the talented Tammy Terrell being a good example of this. Do you think he did this knowingly or maybe he had a very big team to keep up with every small detail in the company? It is no doubt that at its peak, Motown Records was operating 24 hours daily. Is this excuse enough? Anyway, that aside, his positives outweigh the negatives, no doubt. No one is perfect. Despite coming from a rich family, he did all he could in changing the world in a better way. He let God use him as a vessel of the less privileged. From a blind kid like Stevie Wonder to the likes of Marvin Gaye, Tammy Terrell, who had very disturbing and troubled childhood, he gave them the platform to show the world the gifts they had in them. With him currently valued over $450 million, he is slowly enjoying life in Palm Desert in California, satisfied and knowing that he did his part in positively impacting the society. Long live Berry Gordy!